strongly suggest you first watch both my P51 Mustang manifold pressure video and my video comparing the early DF109G models against the P51 in terms of speed. I'll link both of those videos in the description below. If you watched my earlier videos, you know that the 109G series has an engine that's much larger than the P51s. It has 35.7 liters of displacement versus only 27 liters for the Mustang. Yet the P51's Merlin engine is more powerful, largely due to its ability to run higher manifold pressure values, which are largely because of the higher octane fuel that was in use by P51s at the time. These factors, combined with some aerodynamic advantages, allow the P51 to fly much faster than the early 109Gs, usually between 40 and 60 miles per hour faster, depending on the specific variance altitudes and some of the variables. To address this, the Germans had to increase the power from the 109's DB605 engine. However, fuel quality issues, meaning lack of high octane fuel, prevented them from simply increasing the manifold pressure, so they had to think a little outside the box. This led to the MW50 methanol water injection system and the development of their higher octane C3 fuel. This video will focus heavily on methanol water injection. It's also possible to inject pure water or very yet another variable we can't really account for. Up front, there were at least three variants of the DB605 engine. The top dog was the DB605DC, which was run with both C3 fuel and MW50. With this combination, at times it was authorized to run at 1.98 bar or 59.2 inches of manifold pressure, giving it 2,000 horsepower. This is likely the configuration that boosted it over 450 miles per hour. Another combination was the DB605DB engine. This was probably more common. It could be configured to run with either C3 fuel or with B4 fuel and MW50. Both combinations ran at 1.8 bar, 54 inches. With the C3 fuel, it put out 1,800 horsepower at sea level and 1,550 at just under 20,000 feet. Now with the B4 fuel, so lower octane fuel, but with MW50, it had an additional 50 horsepower, which I think also shows the effectiveness of water methanol injection, or what the Germans called methanol water injection. Of course, with the extra power, it needed to spray more MW50 fluid, so now it ran, ran the tank dry in two 10-minute bursts of power. But that's still quite a bit of time for, for running that, that setting. Now, all of these engines and uh, allowable manifold pressure values varied constantly. As far as I can tell, the use of 1.98 bar was authorized. Then it was unauthorized due to complications with the extra power. Then it was authorized again. C3 fuel was often unavailable, sometimes bases they didn't have methanol. In short, we really have to cherry pick a specific and rare 109, the K model, and then in a specific configuration to argue that it was faster than the P51D. But that is a configuration that did exist. Nobody knows how many 109Ks were built, but it appears to be around 500, of which probably at least half were destroyed before they ever flew. The remainder would have been outnumbered by probably 10 to 1 or more once they were in the air. The plane's speed and an incredible climb rate would have helped, but the situation was really hopeless for the German pilots by the time the 109K came around. Still, and I'm going to somewhat paraphrase author Martin Caden on this, a P-51 pilot in a 1V1 against a 109 at the end of the war did have to be seriously concerned. There was a chance, however small, that the 109 he was facing was a K-4, and it could have been a K-4 capable of 1.98 ATA, and it could have a pilot with the controls who has over 100 kills to his name. The 109 may have been outdated, but it did perform, and it was a fearsome opponent right up until the end of the war. Before we close this out, I want to add one more thing. I see a lot of talk about what the Germans should have done. Everybody's using 2020 hindsight. People often argue that the Germans could have held out longer had they brought in the jet fighter sooner, shifted production from the 109 to the 190 or some other plane. Almost all of these arguments have fatal flaws in them. However, I do think that there is something they could have done, and I've never once heard anybody mention this. They could have brought the MW50 system into action in 1940. They knew about this technology. It required nothing new. It's simple, inexpensive, 
and easy to install. Imagine the effect of BF-109Fs in 1940 with the MW-50 type system only using individual nozzles for each cylinder so it could run a CFR of 0 0.6 to 1 instead of only 0.3. That would have allowed for an easy extra 2 to 300 horsepower with B4 fuel. Had the 109F been so equipped in 1940 and the FW-190 set up that way in 1941, the various Allied Air Forces would have been in for a much rougher time. That's all I have for now. I hope you're having a great day and goodbye. Greetings, this is Greg. I would like to talk about the very advanced supercharger drive system used in the Messerschmitt BF-109. It's more advanced than any other drive system I've ever seen on a supercharger in either the aviation or automotive world. It has the advantage of being able to infinitely vary the supercharger impeller speed throughout a huge range, independently of engine RPM, and even bring the impeller to a near stop. We're going to start off here by looking at the American P-40 Warhawks Allison engine and supercharger. Like just about all World War II fighters, the P-40 has a supercharger to boost the engine's power and to help it sustain this power in the thinner air at high altitudes. Without a supercharger, the Allison engine would have a maximum manifold pressure of about 30 inches of mercury. With all other factors equal, more manifold pressure equals more power and the supercharger is capable of delivering the engine's maximum allowable manifold pressure of 52 inches. Let's take a look at the Allison engine and its supercharger. It's mounted at the back of the engine, which you'll see it in the comments. The only thing I can come up with is that it may offer advantages in supercharger intake design since the air only has to turn 90 degrees instead of 180 degrees to reach the impeller. In my own testing in cars, that doesn't really make any difference if the intake is designed properly, is sufficiently uh, sufficient diameter piping and such. But then again, I'm not testing ram air intakes at 400 miles an hour. I'm testing things up to maybe 80 miles an hour, which is kind of a different world. In short, I don't know why the Germans love to drive the supercharger at a 90 degree angle with the crank. Um, I think that that, and that reason may have never been known in the English-speaking world and I think it's been lost in the German-speaking world, but I don't know that for sure. Now what's really unique here, though, is the way the supercharger is driven. It's driven by a hydraulic coupling. Technically, it's a Fottinger coupling invented by somebody named Hermann Fottinger. This type of coupling has been used in other applications, and principles of it are easily found online. Just search for Hermann Fottinger. The advantage of this coupling is that it's nearly as efficient as a direct gear drive, but allows for total speed control of the impeller. Thus, there's no need to throttle it at low altitudes. Thus, you don't get throttling losses. At low altitudes and full throttle, the coupler will automatically adjust the impeller speed for maximum manifold pressure. As the plane climbs, the pilot doesn't need to do anything. He can just leave the throttle in place, and the regulator and coupler will continue to adjust the speed so that it maintains maximum manifold pressure. This is much more effective than throttling. Throttling means cutting off the air to the supercharger to regulate boost at low altitudes. And by not having to throttle it, it just allows for more performance. And it also allows a wider range of operation. The Fottinger coupler in this application allows the ME109's engine to hold maximum manifold pressure by adjusting impeller speed from sea level up to almost 20,000 feet. That's really good for a single stage supercharger. None of this should be taken to mean that the 109 supercharging system as a whole was superior to later American airplanes. I, I don't think it is. Uh, for example, typical U.S. Navy fighters have dual superchargers with two speeds on one of them, plus intercooling. These systems were very effective. However, the 109 supercharger drive system, when viewed by itself, was generally superior, and it is a big part of the reason the 109E was equal or better to any other fighter in 1939. And even by 1945, the performance of the late 109s, like the K4, were about equal to the latest P51s. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I hope you're having a great day. Bye-bye. Greetings.
students. This is Greg. Let's talk about aircraft turning performance, meaning minimum turn radius and maximum turn rate. Later in the video, I'll show you how to calculate these numbers for yourself. I see a lot of internet debates about which plane turned faster, this one or that one. Often, the debate is about the North American P-51 Mustang versus the Messerschmitt BF-109. By the way, really sharp observers may have noticed that wasn't a P-51 I just showed you. Here you go. There's a P-51 with the amazing Dora 9 in the background. That's a matchup I'd like to talk about another time, perhaps in another video. You can find solid evidence that the P-51 could outturn the 109, and vice versa. I'll link two videos in the description below. One shows World War II ace Bud Anderson describing a dogfight in his P-51, where he was clearly able to outturn a 109 and gain advantage. Another is a video of Skip Holm, who's a former... Have you 
got any candidates? Oh, no, as yet, but we'll find a young somewhere. They uh, still have babies, ain't they? Well, yeah. They sound serious about that. Oh, don't worry about that one. I'll damn mind that one back home. No, Sheriff, but we was kind of hoping that, uh, well, that you'd help spread the word. You know, the uh, young fella that gets them the line of here comes into a pretty good dowry. Beneath my damn cottage on the back plenty. All it needs is a roof, some fresh mud on the floor. It'd be a real paradise. And a cow comes with it. <laughs> a cow comes right with it, huh? Two acres of side hill with good, strong boulders. <laughs> well, that sounds like a good deal, Mr. Darling. Wouldn't you say, Bart? Well, yeah. I mean, a cow and everything. That boulders. <laughs> be disappointed if you get turned down a few times. If worse comes to worse, we'll write to that Europe and bring in and out of town. <laughs> well, that is here. This is a surprise. Ain't it? <laughs> well, uh, come on in, won't you? Boys. Hi, Chef. Charlie. Boys. this way so late after supper. Well, we finished looking for the day, so we thought we'd come by and pick with you a little bit. Oh, well, I can't think of anything I'd rather do. <laughs> uh, so I sat down. Boy? Jody? <laughs> well, did you uh, have any luck finding anybody for Andalina today? <sighs> well, we come across one young one, but uh, he had a big word on him if he's no one. <laughs>